process, you know, when I think of enchantment, I think of it as the process by which a human being begins to open up both to themselves and to the world around them. And enchantment is also different from what we think of when we think of enlightenment in the Western context. Welcome to The Neutral Ground. This week, I'm honored to be joined by Chloe Valdery. Chloe is the author of a fantastic program called The Theory of Enchantment. Now, the purpose of the program is to unite people on matters of diversity through the power of love and a greater understanding of what it means to be human. We talk about the three main tenets of her program. We throw a bit of Jung in here and there to establish some psychology behind why the program is so successful. And we talk about needing to get to a place where we can disagree with each other while maintaining a spirit of love for the other person in our hearts. My hope is that by the end of the conversation, you feel a stronger connection to those around you. Should you find yourself inspired, consider hitting the subscribe slash follow button and leaving a kind comment or rating where applicable. We're working really hard here at the Neutral Ground Podcast to bring civil discourse and human connection in front of as many people as possible. And each positive click and interaction will help us do so. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Chloe Valdery. Chloe, welcome to The Neutral Ground. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. Well, I'm excited for this conversation, and it's absolutely my pleasure to have you on to talk about something that really tries to express how important it is for us to recognize the ways in which we connect with each other as a species on a common level. Now, before we dive into the particulars of your theory of enchantment, which is a program that seeks to cultivate unity in the workplace through the practice of love, I would actually like to ask you to talk a little bit about what you saw in the world that led you to believe we need a new way to have difficult, meaningful conversations. Yeah, so I was, I guess, really thinking about the concept of enchantment uh, heavily in college and specifically senior year in college. I was uh, with a very... I I guess you would say dogmatic mindset in college. And I encountered a professor who challenged that way of thinking, modeled a different way of thinking. And she encouraged me by modeling that to, I guess, become more curious about um, challenging my own ways of seeing the world, challenging the paradigms I had, um, you know, grew up with. And my major was in international studies with a concentration in conflict and diplomacy. And there were all of these interesting tools that one could use to combat conflict, but there was no specific emphasis on love as a practice. And so once I left university, I ended up developing a theory on how to do that, on how to approach conflict with love that ended up being called the theory of enchantment. Let me ask you this to kind of piggyback off of that a little bit. How was your professor able to model this idea for you? Because oftentimes today, especially in in teaching, this is something that I believe heavily in as, as well in the classroom. It's one thing to tell the students, this is what you should think, which is something that I've always found creates kind of resistance right away as opposed to simply saying, here's an, <clears throat> excuse me, here's an approach and I'm going to model that for you so that you can see how this kind of works. So how, how was your professor able to, to model something like this that was so groundbreaking for you? Well, my professor was a, an agnostic. And at the time, my, one of my dogmas was that atheists and or agnostics were sort of persona non grata. And so I assume that she would have a very biased view against religious people. Of course, I had the biased view against her. And she gave us an assignment um, to watch a documentary about evangelical community that did not portray them in the best light. 
And the uh, next day I came back to school, there was a, a student in the classroom who was an atheist who started railing on the community in this documentary. And then my professor actually defended the community and basically said something along the lines of, if you don't understand how human beings make decisions uh, out of a space of often scarcity or even just out of a space for a need to belong and a, a space of needing community. And if you can't see how, even though you might disagree with the decisions that this community made, if you can't see how those decisions were still being driven by basic human needs, then you're misunderstanding the purpose of this class. And I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting someone who I had put into a box to sort of defy it. And so she wasn't, you know, intentionally modeling it. She just happened to model it. And that actually led to a lot of questioning that I had to do about, like I said, the paradigms that I had been carrying up until that point. That's fantastic. Yeah, just showing that there's enough distance between the thought and the action and the the kind of wrestling that has to take place there by your by your teacher you could kind of visibly feel it or see that wrestling taking place and the negotiation between i have my thoughts here but i need to model other ways of of behaving and thinking about this that is absolutely i think something that we all need to to take into consideration when we're modeling for especially young people today as well to be able to do that you you of course the the term and you mentioned this even earlier the term enchantment is in the, the title of this right and i was actually drawn to this this term as i was reading about your program i'd like to ask you about the term enchantment because i think it's coming up more and more in today's culture and society and actually recently on the show i had dr john rosegrant on who's a clinical psychologist and he wrote a book, believe it or not, on Tolkien, Enchantment, and Loss. Cool. Yes, it's fantastic. And his, his basic argument, or one of his main arguments, was that Tolkien in modernism was essentially worried about the loss of enchantment in the world and how that could create a loss of creativity, which could also lead to then a kind of despair because then we have no way of escaping the claustrophobic individual mind. And so when I saw the word enchantment in your program, it, it made me wonder, how are you using that term enchantment? And how does it how does it function within your program? So it's funny, enchantment was almost coincidentally uh, chosen, because at the time, when I was at the Wall Street Journal, I was working on a paper that ended up being the I guess the founding paper for the theory of enchantment and I was trying to crack this question open of how to teach people how to love and I was researching pop culture because people love pop culture and so or different brands in pop culture and I was wondering what the psychology of that was and I was studying all these brands like Nike and Beyonce and Disney and Apple and came across a book by Guy Kawasaki, the former marketing director of Apple, who wrote a book called Enchantment. And he talked about how enchantment was the process by which you delight someone and how Steve Jobs used that in a lot of his uh, designing of different Mac products. And enchantment just seemed like the proper fit uh, to capture what it was I was trying to do. And I think more recently, I've thought about this word because it pops up in many different contexts. It pops up in a lot of uh, Jungian contexts. It pops up in a lot of uh, conversations about fairy tales and children's stories and, of course, Disney. Uh, and there's this process, you know, when I think of enchantment, I think of it as the process by which a human being begins to open up both to themselves and to the world around them. And enchantment is also different from what we think of when we think of enlightenment in the Western context, not in the Buddhist context. Um, enchantment is, is not blinding light in the same way that it was represented in the enlightenment. It's actually a combination and a balancing of light and darkness, uh, similar to the yin-yang symbol 
in Taoism. It's it's far more integrated uh, than the way in which light is portrayed in the Enlightenment. So it's not blinding light, it's more of a balance or an integration of opposites, which one has to do in order to achieve wholeness uh, and which a society has to do in order to achieve wholeness. Um, so it started off as a kind of coincidental thing I happened to stumble upon through research, but it was definitely meant to be. Yeah, and it works quite well. And, and you mentioned, of course, Jung and this idea of the archetypes and integrating certain aspects. And today, we, we, I think we're starting to understand more why it's so important to integrate things like the shadow uh, within us as, as a means of the balancing that you mentioned, right? Because it, it, there are reasons to be somewhat afraid of that integration because it can go very wrong. And yet at the same time, if you don't, you lose a mechanism by which to really address the self-actualization that's required of all of us. And that includes in areas of like what you're dealing with, which are difficult discussions where we talk about uh, race and cultural differences, things that oftentimes make people uncomfortable. And by looking at it through this vision of unification and love, I think part of the hope right away, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is to maybe stop seeing it by default as an uncomfortable conversation and to maybe start thinking about it as a conversation, just leaving it there. It doesn't have to be uncomfortable, but if you go in to these conversations without a better understanding, without maybe that uh, the the enchantment of being open to what others have to say, then you can already pretty much predict that it's going to be an uncomfortable conversation. Well, I wouldn't say that the goal is necessarily to to make it comfortable, but rather to be okay with discomfort. Because mm. if we're talking about love, then, I mean, people, you know, people speak about love in a very cliche sort of hackneyed willy nilly way. But when theory of enchantment is talking about love, we're talking about equanimity, which is a capacity to, to sort of be content with whatever life brings, including suffering, including sorrow, the highs and the lows of life. It's a capacity to dance with the vicissitudes of life. And that requires becoming comfortable with, the, with what is uncomfortable. So it's not about getting rid of stuff that's uncomfortable, but actually giving people tools, giving people the willpower, facilitating a space where you know, courage and wisdom can be used as tools when dealing with topics issues that are uncomfortable because life is fundamentally uncomfortable in many ways. Absolutely. One of the, the, one of the things that I try to do in the classroom constantly is to get my students to willingly walk into chaos and just stand there. Cause I'm one of those people who I have purposefully, I put a timer up when we do group exercises and I make it really big. And the first time we do it, I make it as big as I can. And I ask the students flat out, does seeing this timer going down, does it make you anxious? And they say, yeah, it actually kind of does. I say, okay, that's fine. Recognize that. And start to learn that it's just time. Start to become, instead of anxious about the, seeing the time tick down, start to let that guide you toward putting order, imposing order on the chaotic moment. And so being comfortable with discomfort. I like that, that approach. I, I want to start diving into the particulars of your theory here, right? Because there are three main tenets to this. And I want to break down each one a little bit for the audience so we can get a better understanding of, of what we're going to be discussing. The first one is treat people like humans not political abstractions. Mm -hmm. And it's very popular today to politicize the human being. Mm -hmm. I actually recently actually just got yelled at actually for saying to someone, not everything has to be political. 
and I was immediately corrected that all things are political. Everything, every decision we make is political. And I just kind of stood there and I just kind of smiled. So let me ask you, what do you mean by treating people like humans, not political abstractions? And how do we do this in a world that has seemingly grown even beyond hyper politicization at this point? Well, I think what we try to teach in the theory of enchantment when we teach this principle is what it actually means to be a human being. And we start out with a practice called the who am I practice where you're asked to uh, set a timer for three minutes and ask yourself, who am I? And write down what comes to you and silently say to yourself, thank you for everything that comes to you. And also be honest and admit to yourself those things that you don't like about yourself, that you also are, and also say thank you after those things. And this practice is for the purpose of getting people to start to recognize their full complexity and to express gratitude for it, because the act of stereotyping others and the act of caricaturing others is simultaneously an act of stereotyping and caricaturing oneself. So for example, if I say that a group of people over there are lazy, I'm denying the fact that sometimes I'm lazy. And it works in the opposite way as well. I am jealous of another group of people and I say that they're hardworking. I'm denying the fact that sometimes I'm hardworking. And um, Thich Nhat Hanh, who just passed away, who was the Buddhist monk who was um, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Dr. King, says that pride is when you say that you're better than someone else and also when you say that you're worse than someone else. That too is pride. Uh, So we start with that exercise to get people to see their complexity, to start to see their complexity, their fullness, and to recognize how stereotyping someone actually has a double bind Um, Because again, when you're stereotyping yourself, you're stereotyping others. And then we go into um, all the things that we need to thrive as human beings. We study Maslow's, you know, triangle of needs. We go into all of the things that human beings, um, all the emotions that we can experience, conflicting, contradictory emotions at the same time. And we go into what happens when our needs aren't met, how we fall into a default automatic you know, fight or flight stage or a uh, scarcity oriented stage where we do splitting, which is a term in psychology where, which basically means it's a defensive mechanism that human beings do where they say all these people over here are good and all those people over here are bad, not realizing that there's good and bad in everyone. And so when our needs aren't being met, when we don't have the proper tools to get in right relationship with the fullness of ourselves, including our insecurities and our baggage, let's say, then we default into that split way of thinking. Um, And so we actually unpack what it means to be a human being um, in that, in that first principle or with that first principle. When you're discussing Maslow's uh, tiers of hierarchy of needs, do you, do you find that sometimes people underestimate or maybe overestimate the lower tiers of the needs today. Another, I guess what I'm trying to ask is when we think of the physiological tiers, the things like food, sleep, you know, basic needs, do you find that people tend to add elements to that and overcomplicate it today? I need my phone. I need my this and my that. Is part of what you do to even break down and, and kind of recalibrate that those lower tiers so that we can say it's okay to be content with that these are met because we need to move to the, the more self-actualization tiers? So one of the things I point out is that Maslow didn't actually call it a hierarchy. Um, so that's why I call it a triangle of needs, not a hierarchy of needs, because he thought that all of these needs were interrelated. Um, but to answer your question, no, I actually haven't received any responses that overemphasize like the cell phone or I usually get responses like, 
family and connection and belonging and you know challenges and I, I I usually don't I mean I haven't actually received any answers that were superficial uh in that way and you know that uh, that game so to speak comes up later in the workshop so we have primed the audience to have deeper conversations by that point so it may be that that's why people don't give superficial answers but i haven't i haven't received those kinds of answers that's a good thing that makes me happy quite honestly <laughs> yeah. um okay so so the second tenant here of the theory of enchantment is criticize to uplift and empower and when I was doing my research for this, I kind of stared at that term empower for a minute. And I thought to myself, there are two kind of functional definitions here for empower. One is this idea of, of, of empowering someone so that they have the more agency in their decisions, right? And I think that's probably the most common usage that we have here. And I think you're probably using it a lot in that way. But then I also thought of the idea of someone ceding authority to another, this kind of transference. And that got me thinking. Today we find that topic of ceding authority or power to someone else to be somewhat problematic. It's difficult for us. But as teachers, and, and both of us are teaching, oftentimes we have to cede authority or power to the students because that's how they get to practice it in some ways in understanding how they, how they work. I'm curious about this because it's a difficult kind of topic today, power and authority. In your discussions of power and authority in groups, how do you negotiate these ideas without the conversation devolving into power struggles and, and collections of power? That's a great question. I mean, most people do that I've come across when they hear the word empower, they, they hear the first definition that you um, said, th but they bring up, they might bring up the, the second definition in a different context. So not necessarily related to the second principle, but in a different context. And the way I usually negotiate that is by telling them or showing them how the power structure mindset, the power structure paradigm is still a stereotype. You're still stereotyping when you say that, you know, I had an experience recently where someone was objecting to the fact that I was telling a story about how a man who happened to be African American responded to a man who happened to be white this the white guy was racist um who who responded to him with love instead of with hatred and i was basically asked like why are we why is the onus on the oppressed to you know show love to the oppressor and i asked this person do you think that in this moment the black man identified as oppressed because what I think is actually happening here is a whole person is engaging with a broken person. And that person could not have possibly identified as oppressed and internally in order to be able to make that move, in order to be able to respond to hatred with love, which is not possible from a psychological perspective. And he said, yes, that's a good question. And I, and I said, so isn't that still a stereotype? That is still a caricature that we are imposing, superimposing upon this human being. And, you know, this entire workshop is trying to teach us about how to step out of the default state that human beings have, which is to stereotype ourselves and others, right? Um, so it does come up a lot in that context. I will also say that there's a history of where that comes from in the West, um, this whole idea of seeing the world as a fundamentally fallen state ruled by a fundamentally corrupt cabal and needing to 
overtake it and overthrow it and bring in a higher power that has roots in Gnosticism from the second century during Hellenistic period. Um, Carl Jung said that human beings default state is Gnostic, um, but it's not new. It's not contemporary. It's not even American <laughs> in its original intent. It goes way, way back, which isn't to say that everything about Gnosticism is bad, but that binary way of thinking easily feeds into bigotry and easily becomes a kind of conspiratorial mindset um, that can totally take over a person's worldview if they're not careful. You're making me think of something too that that I discussed um, both in the classroom and even on the podcast. When people bring up Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. a lot today, right? But in some sense, something that I think people are losing sight of a little bit is that idea of the civil disobedience is not simply an act of of um, being in one in a, in a place. It's actually a decision to say, I'm not going to be a part of your continuing search for power. It's a kind of anti Nietzschean will to power idea that says, I know you want to overcome me because then you can continue your road and pathway to collect more power, but I'm not going to participate in it. And that is a far deeper idea than we give King and, and Gandhi and, and, um, and others credit for. It's that I'm choosing not to participate in that. And that's sort of what I'm, I'm hearing you talk about even in that situation with the two individuals, the idea of thinking, I'm choosing not to participate in your continuing pathway of trying to create more sites of, of racism in the world. I'm not going to do it. Well, but it's also a recognition that the person who is trying to do that is fundamentally broken. Yeah. Right. And that's a very different mindset than some of the mindsets that are part of the culture today. There's this weird, strange sense, which isn't explicitly stated, but which is alluded to, which is that the quote unquote oppressor is somehow in a psychologically, not only healthy position, but desirable position. And that is fundamentally a flawed way of thinking and that leads to people coming to crazy conclusions about how to deal with that situation. Many of the civil rights leaders recognized that supremacy is a psychological breakdown, fundamentally. It is an overcompensation. I mean, James Baldwin wrote about this extensively, especially in The Fire next time. It is an overcompensation for a feeling of deep-seated worthlessness. And if you recognize that, then you will respond differently than you would respond if you if you took the facade, if you didn't understand that supremacy was a facade, but you took it at its own word, so to speak. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so the, the final tenet here of your theory of enchantment is root everything you do in love and compassion. Mm -hmm. why love and compassion? I mean, we're all 21st century, highly educated people. Aren't we past such trivial things as love and compassion? Of course, I'm playing this <laughs> up, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, no, we're not. And uh, we still haven't mastered that. And we, I mean, we haven't in many ways come close to mastering it as a species. Um, I said earlier that by love, we mean equanimity. So the third principle is the culmination of the first two. So the idea is that if you really learn how to practice the first two, you will be practicing the third. And it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. And it's not, there's no such thing as perfection um, in this practice, but we are talking about equanimity. Another word for that is unconditional love or agape love, which Dr. King said was this aim and ideal of the civil rights movement. That was the purpose of the, civil rights, of the civil rights movement, ultimately, was to model that way of being. And that's ultimately what we're trying to learn and teach people how to do in theory of enchantment. And it's excruciatingly difficult. 
Yeah, especially when people, I would imagine, come in it because we tend to be quite cynical today. And that's actually what I believe. That's our biggest enemy of today is cynicism. I hate it. I can't stand it. And it's 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 something that I try to push back against it, it, both in the classroom and in the outside world if I see it, it, it because it, it immediately destroys our one of our greatest assets as a species, this idea that we have collectively come here. We have worked together to get to this point of where we are in society, and we can't abandon all that work that we did, the community that we built as a species. You just can't abandon that. And you can't abandon hope, as of course, you know, Dante right above hell, abandon hope, all ye, you know, who enter. That's not a trivial thing that Dante wrote. He knew, in a sense, hell is the abandonment of all hope. Well, yeah. oh, please go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I think that people are cynical because they don't know how to deal with suffering. And, you know, there's obviously a number of teachings on this within the Christian wisdom tradition and in many other wisdom traditions as well. But one of the things Dr. King said was that you should understand that, um, I'm trying to remember the full statement, he said something about like unearned stuff. Oh, unearned suffering is redemptive. He says this in his, I have a dream speech. And it's a very like, if you, if you don't, if you weren't raised in the Christian context, you might not even understand. Like, I would be like, well, what does that, I don't know what that means. Um, but basically there's this deep understanding that many wisdom traditions have that life is suffering. And that doesn't mean that we don't try to alleviate suffering, but we will never be able to fully escape suffering. Suffering is built into the very fabric of being itself. And if you try to escape it, you're, you're just gonna, you're just gonna have a hard time and a hard life. And so the question then becomes, what are those tools that we can acquire to holistically deal with suffering? James Baldwin said that people cling to their hatred because they don't know how to deal with pain, right? He's talking about suffering. And so prejudice is actually a coping mechanism to deal with suffering. Um, and I think that we become, when I think of cynicism, I think, you know, we become physically hardened because we don't know how to deal with suffering because we haven't as a culture actually developed the tools and given the tools to ourselves and to each other that helps us deal with suffering, whether that's meditation, whether that's, you know, um, other things that we can get from other teachings that we can get from different wisdom traditions, like they're, they're definitely available, but as a culture, we have not taken it upon ourselves to inculcate that in a deliberate and intentional way um, into the way we do life. And as long as that is the case, there will always be the possibility of cynicism building into and cynicism is related to um a culture that prizes power as its highest value right because if you're pursuing power as the highest value it's not like it's because you're simply a monster right it's actually more the case that you don't know how to deal with suffering and the only tool that you've been exposed to is this very consumptive way of being where you have to acquire power. There are so many villains in our, you know, in our culture's most famous films that become villains because they did not know how to deal with their own suffering and they automatically just fell into a mad quest for power because they didn't know how to deal with pain. And so I think that that is... A, a huge source of where cynicism comes from in our culture. Absolutely. And that quest for power, they soon realize it never ends. Right. It's never no fulfilling. End. Yeah, absolutely. It never yeah. ends. There's no clear stopping point yeah. where you can say, I have enough power. Okay. This, yeah. this leads beautifully into uh, something I want to talk about here, which is this idea of your use of the arts and how you think of the arts. Mm -hmm. broadly right music painting literature all, all these different arts 
Mm-hmm. I actually had, um, I don't know if you're familiar with him, uh, Dr. Angus Fletcher, who wrote Wonder Works. Okay. It's a fantastic book. He is a uh, neurologist. Cool. And, and is in the uh, narrative program at Ohio State University. And his book essentially talks about how great, great stories mm-hmm. actually alter the way we think mm-hmm. on a neurological level, on a biological level. And there's a reason why I think intuitively we know that great stories can build courage within us. But he went and actually got the science mm, to nice. back it up that it can actually happen. Yeah. Now. Here's where this is, connects back with you and something that you said on your own podcast, The Heart Speaks, that really struck me. You were talking about the musician Kendrick Lamar, and you mentioned that one of the reasons you enjoy his music is that he's able to channel pain through an expressive medium, through music. And you essentially argue, and I thought this was brilliant, you argue that pain functions like the conservation of mass. It can't be destroyed. It can only kind of change form or in your case, be transferred to something else. And then you drop this um, old African proverb. And I'm going to read it here for the audience. The child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down just to feel its warmth. Now that is horrifying and and should create pain within us in a time of let's call it adult hyper individualism you know of children feeling depressed anxious lonely turning to violence even have we forgotten the greatest asset that we have for protecting our children is the support support structures even tools like we've been talking about of the collective community of humanity beyond just the immediate structure, even within the home. Mm. It's so funny because oftentimes conservatives and I grew up conservative and I, I love the conservatives. I'm not bad mouthing conservatives, but (laughs) conservatives will say, um, you know, the two parent family is the, is the model that we need to champion. But what they don't realize is that that's actually a very modern invention and was a product of the industrial revolution and prior to that families were actually much bigger and were much more sort of like came in packs you know you had not only two parents but you had grandparents and aunts and uncles and you had a village basically (laughs) that were that were raising kids And that changed with the Industrial Revolution. And of course, you know, things change, we adapt. But there's this idea that ironically comes out of a very, you could call it hyper-individualistic way of thinking, um, which is viewed as the historically ancient model, which is actually, in fact, very new and very contemporary, um, And very much in the strictest sense of the word, not conservative at all. And so there is a valid question to be asked about how we choose to raise our families, how we choose to build societies. There's a great book uh, called Alienated America by Timothy Carney, where he talks about how the death of the village, basically, and how that impacted many rural cities that flipped from voting for Obama in his second and first elections to voting for Trump in his election. And he talks about how a lot of these communities were uprooted by a number of different factors, economic and otherwise, but that with that sense of uprootedness, you know, these communities used to be small but very local, very tight knit, very um, enmeshed, Uh, but they became uprooted. And with that sense of uprootedness, there came to be things like alcoholism and, you know, numb coping situations, coping mechanisms that are used to numb pain, right? That are used to numb a person or community when there is scarcity and how that played a role in politics. And so there is a conversation, there should be a conversation about 
you know, what does it, what, what should our societies look like? What does, what does it mean to actually build interdependent societies, which is actually the next level past independence, it's interdependency. Um, so how do you build a village? How do you build a society such that a nation can actually experience interdependency and we can bring into fruition our original motto, which is out of many, one. How do you actually do that? And, you know, it doesn't have to be because oftentimes when people hear a, a, a big idea, mm -hmm. they become what I call like future tired. They're tired <laughs> for a moment that doesn't even exist yet. <laughs> They're just exhausted. I experience this sometimes when I'm, you know, like I have a, a, a paper I have to deliver in a couple of weeks at a conference. Mm -hmm. And when I, as soon as I hit the send button to say, okay, here's the thing, I immediately got future tired. Cause yeah. I was like, oh man, now I've got to write this thing. <laughs> I yeah. can't do that. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be huge, large movements, especially in the beginning. I, I just finished watching um, the, the, the comedian Norm MacDonald who passed away, mm -hmm. his last kind of special they put on Netflix. And at the end, they had this round table with comedians, Dave Chappelle, Adam mm -hmm. Sandler, David Spade. And Chappelle said something that stuck with me. He said what he loved about Norm MacDonald was when Chappelle's father passed away, that same week he had to go do a movie with Norm MacDonald. And mm -hmm. he said he was inconsolable and he tried mm -hmm. everything he could to get out of the movie. And if it weren't for Norm MacDonald, he would have probably just been unable to get anything done. And yeah. McDonald didn't say anything mm -hmm. about his father. Mm -hmm. Chappelle said all he did was he was there for me. He, he helped me move through life. Just mm -hmm. move. Yeah. And he made me laugh. Mm -hmm. So even if we can just extend this idea of the support group beyond the family, and if you have the father and the mother in the home, that's great. Yeah. Wonderful. But there are still a lot of situations that don't have that. And we yeah. can't just simply say, well, then they're out of luck. <laughs> like right. That's too bad. We right. can't do that. Yeah. Even if we can just extend it to the point where we can ask each other, how are you doing? What's going on today? What are you yeah. working on? That kind of a thing to keep those connections moving. Yeah. Let me ask you this. How do you use the arts in your theory to, to get your message across? I mean, we, the arts, <laughs> the arts and pop culture are very pervasive throughout theory of enchantment. Um, we use them as tools to help people connect to those three principles. So we, we talk about Kendrick Lamar, um, you know, Kendrick Lamar's song, DNA. We, we use that, that particular lyric where he says, I got power, poison, pain, and joy inside my DNA to help people start to realize their own complexities and their own contradictions and to acquire that same amount of self-awareness that Kendrick has. Um, we teach Disney movies in our online course to, to help people really introspect about all kinds of things. I mean, there's a part where we teach people about the importance of uh, looking beyond surface or appearances. And of course, in the movie Aladdin, the motto of Aladdin is, do not be fooled by its outward appearance. It is what, not what is on the outside, but what is on the inside that counts. And like one of the characters says that in the first five minutes of the film, a lot of, of the Disney films that came out in the early 90s and probably uh, before have this habit of putting the motto of the story in the first five minutes, right? When we talk about learning to love, learning to meet hatred with love, the one of the most profoundest questions in Beauty and the Beast is asked in the first two minutes or three minutes of the story, which is who could learn to love a beast? Right. And that is that is what is the point. Like, could, can you actually learn to love a beast? And we talk about you can't learn to love a beast unless you can learn to love the beastly within you. Right. That's the only way you can learn to love a beast, which, again, goes back to integration of all of your parts and being whole with all of your parts. Um, and it's crazy to me how that matches out of many one. And like we don't take seriously that that, you know, um, motto that we have 
set up for ourselves. We use um, other films as well. We use we we study villains in Disney films. So we study Ursula and we study Lotso Bear in Toy Story Three, and we study Frollo in uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame to to show the difference between what criticizing to empower looks like and what criticizing to manipulate looks like or criticizing to exploit looks like. The song Poor Unfortunate Souls from The Little Mermaid is a textbook example of exploitation. The song Mother Dearest in Tangled is a textbook example of exploitation or manipulation. Same thing for Hunchback of Notre Dame where the uh, the villain tries to convince Quasimodo to stay in the stay in the bell tower instead of going outward into chaos, right? To to in order to build yourself up, um, because he wants him to always be codependent on him, right? So we use different. Uh, I mean, we, we obviously there's a lot of Disney stuff and and theory of enchantment, but there's also you know other music that we use. We use we explore one of John Mayer's songs. Um, in the blood to talk about parental baggage. Um, Lil Wayne's song "How to Love" as well is is used to study that. So we take the arts very seriously. We take literature very seriously. I think English literature is one of the un- most underrated, uh, like classes or most underrated tools in terms of developing wholeness and getting in right relationship with the human condition that is out there. So we use a lot of it. You, you're making me think too of that that Disney Renaissance era. Yeah, something that they did really well that I hadn't thought about until you just started talking about it. There is actually quite an interesting balance between seeing manipulation externally mm-hmm. and seeing manipulation internally. Even mm-hmm. just that, uh, mm-hmm. even just Aladdin. You mentioned mm-hmm. a kind of there, there's a clear external manipulation manipulation going on with Jafar, let's mm-hmm. say, but mm-hmm. the internal manipulation that Aladdin mm-hmm. is doing to himself. Yeah. This where idea, he's like, I'm not good enough. Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. Let me yeah. ask you this then. Yeah. So do you find that it's difficult for people to see manipulation internally? Um, well, I, I think that we don't call it manipulation when it's mm. happening internally. We, so they might not identify it as manipulation per se. They might identify it in Aladdin's case, that's just him not accepting himself. Right. Um, that's still fundamentally just like a lack of wholeness, right. A lack of integration. Uh, so even though we talk about those particular character traits, we don't, we just don't label them manipulation in that way. Interesting. Yeah. Because I, I find the more, there are a lot of people who struggle with that inner monologue Mm -hmm. that's constantly telling them you're not good enough. You're not good enough to the point Mm -hmm. that it becomes almost like um, just an automated bodily response. After Mm -hmm. a while, they'll start acting like they're not good enough. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's why I see it as a kind of internal, internal manipulation still. Well, there's a little bit of a Jungian stuff that I could say about that, but that might go over too many people's heads and, and go for it. Go over our heads. <laughs> well, you know, Jung believed in like what he called the animus and the anima. And without getting too complicated, basically the animus is the masculine within a woman and the anima is the feminine that is within a man. And he probably would describe some of those things that you're pointing out as manipulation on the part of the animus and the anima within a human being. That's a useful metaphor for some people. Um, And if you're like in the world of Jung, that might apply, but it might not be a useful metaphor in other contexts if you're not like as into Jung as I might be. Um, you know, maybe a different wisdom tradition or a different approach would speak to you more. So I guess it just depends upon like who you are as a person and like what resonates with you and what doesn't. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so something that I wanted to ask you about because I find it to be disturbing and I think you 
probably have to address this in your work is I'm the kind of person I can talk to anybody anywhere. I just like the conversation. And actually, recently, I just had a conversation with a woman who um, we were in the grocery store. I was in the meat section and we started talking about trying to figure out what prices were attached to which, to which part. And then we started talking about something else. She mentioned she had a grandson who is going to a college in a, in a local area. Um, I teach at the University at Albany, but he's going somewhere else. And then she started telling me about how she doesn't see him much, though, because his father basically disowned her because she voted for Trump. And that triggered within me a memory close to home, which was my old Sicilian grandmother, as stubborn as they come. She didn't speak to her sister for about 30 years, and then the last time they spoke was quite literally at the younger sister's deathbed. And they cried and cried and cried because they kind of had this realization that the time is gone and can never come back. And today we hear a lot of these similar stories about people disowning family or loved ones for politics or even for things related to COVID, stuff like that. And you can't get that time back. It's gone. In the work that you've been doing to help people, have you been able to see positive outcomes through your program for people to learn to compartmentalize divisive topics today so that they can disagree with someone and still express a feeling of love? I mean, we certainly actually have had testimonials where people have gone through our online course and they've said, you know, I wasn't talking to my brother-in-law and then I did this course and then I started talking to my brother-in-law and it was over some political disagreement. So, and that's something I'm really proud of, you know, like the fact that this is a training that can really uh, encourage people to reach out across the aisle, so to speak, and choose to be in, in relationship with someone who's, you know, politics they disagree with or whose positions on other stuff they disagree with. One of the things we teach in our full day workshop is counter dependency. So we're usually more familiar with codependency, but counter dependency is when your identity becomes dependent upon countering someone. And when you fall into that state, you become mimetic which is basically you, you start to imitate the person and you, like you're, you're subconsciously doing it. You're not doing it consciously, but you start to, to do that. And we saw this, actually, we saw this. Um, most people are familiar with January 6th, but fewer people are familiar with the fact that on January 20th, I believe it was January 20th in Portland, there was a group of Antifa uh, protesters that marched and they held signs that said, we don't want Biden. We like throw him out. This is not what we want. And so they, so so the Trump supporters and the Antifa supporters were actually mirroring each other, even though they're on two completely different spectrums of the political, you know, map. They were imitating each other without even realizing it. And that's what counter dependency is. It's when your identity becomes so defined and locked in by countering another. And that's why the Who Am I game is so important. And I tell people that they should continue to practice it even past the workshop. That's why the Who Am I game is so important. So you can understand all the many parts that you are, and also so that you can understand that you're fundamentally inexhaustible, meaning that you will never actually be able to get to the bottom of who you are. And this is really what it means to be a human being, emphasis on the word being, right? We are constantly dynamic, constantly changing, never fixed, never static beings. And if you can get people to have that kind of perspective or see the world and see themselves through that lens, then they will be able to open up to their own diversity. Someone was complaining the other day that there are only a bunch of white people in the graduation ceremony that this person went to. She's like, there's no diversity. I was like, well, actually, there is diversity. <laughs> there's diversity in the room. You just aren't, you just haven't been given the lens to be able to see it. 
but there's diversity in the room. And so every single human being has diversity within them, right? That's part of the who, who am I game. And so if you can become open to that, uh, experience equanimity with that, then you will begin to be able to project that equanimity onto other people's diversity as well. And that's when you can start to practice unconditional love. You know, I can't think of a better place to stop the conversation than on that wonderful note. Absolutely. Um, Chloe, I can say with 100% confidence that not only is the work that you're doing, I think, really needed today, but it's, in my opinion, humble opinion, it's the only program that is guaranteed to win out in the end, in all eras of human existence, this program will still work because it's about uniting us. And that's ultimately what we need. Thank you so much for coming on the show and, and speaking with me and my audience and for, for helping us understand uh, the beauty of your program. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Chloe Valdery. If you're interested in learning more about Chloe's theory of enchantment, you can use the links that I've provided in the episode notes below. You know, I have to admit, upon finishing our conversation, I actually did feel more connected with humanity and, and had a bit more hope, I think, in my soul. I hope you did as well. Until next time, try to keep one foot firmly planted on neutral ground and have a great day.